so many of the characters are determined by the things that happen to them. And that's a big mm-hmm. aspect of the story is thou mayest versus like your father did this thing mm-hmm. and now you're stuck. And Samuel, he lives this robust, happy, curious life, but he's always poor. Yeah. And he's like, but he's he, doing he, whatever he wants. He's kind of the contradiction. He's the free man he's living the free in man. the strengths of poverty. That's it. He's and, free. Exactly. But he doesn't look free. Welcome to Classical Etc. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Welcome to another episode of Classical Etc. And I'm seated with Paul and Tanya. And today is the long-awaited East of Eden episode. <laughs> the three of us have been, like, for some reason, we decided to read this book this summer. And it is phenomenal. I decided to read it because you guys were reading it. I read it because Paul read it. I read it, I think, Why because... Why did you read it, Paul? <laughs> I wanted to read more Steinbeck. I think Grapes of Wrath, I couldn't get an audio version um, from the library at the time. So I was like, so... My my niece and her boyfriend also recommended it, so I decided that I was going to read it, and I I was captivated from the very beginning. I was too. I was too. But the last time we talked about it, you were only halfway finished and just didn't know what you were. I wasn't going quite to, sure if it was right. going to overtake Grapes of Wrath. So what do you think? I don't know that I think it overtakes Grapes of Wrath at all. They're just, two totally different. Yeah, it just depends. Yeah, in what in what sense? So before we we dive really deep into it, I just want to say this for the audience: there will be what I would call spoiler alerts. Mm. <laughs> we are going to ruin this novel. You've had a hundred years, um, and <laughs> we, as we discuss it, just if if you want to go read it and then listen, that would be fine. But also, I think our conversation will also prep people to read it. It's the kind of book that knowing the end of it, I don't think it ruins it. It could help people to know what themes they should be looking for, how to understand the characters. Um, so back to, back to your question, Tanya. I think I want to ask you, I want to turn this back to you guys. What is the main point of East of Eden? Is, is there a singular message that you think is at the heart of it? Or do you think that there are several themes? Is there a most important theme? Is there a most important character? I think the most important theme, I think there are other themes running through it, but I think the most important is Timsha, hmm. which is, I don't even know how to explain that shortly, um, from because it is a metaphor on the Cain and Abel story, mm-hmm. um, which I knew, which everybody knows going yeah, into it. Yeah, I, I mean, it said it on, on the synopsis of the book, but I kept looking for it. And I think I mentioned oh, this uh, in, in another I podcast. Like it was so no, obvious. I kept looking for it in like a, a C.S. Lewis Narnia kind of way, and it, it's a metaphor in a Tolkien kind of way. Mm, mm. Is 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 when I got to the end, I was like, oh, okay. I was misreading. I was my expectation was wrong insofar as what I was looking for. Okay, no. you want to explain the difference in a C.S. Lewis? You mean just less obvious? Oh, way less obvious, and and much more. So instead of it being like one. Uh, um, metaphor through the entire book, right? Like in an allegory, which is very clear for C.S. Lewis, right? Who Aslan is kind of thing. With Tolkien, you've got multiple characters representing different aspects mm-hmm. of the Christ figure, right? And I think I felt like in East of Eden, there were multiple, because there are multiple brothers yes. that have struggles yes, between and, the two. And the first brother, Charles, is actually scarred. Yes. He actually has the scar, so it's like, that is more of a C.S. Lewis. Yeah, Here so that's why I'm, I was. I'm looking for you know. But then the second brother, yeah. Caleb, who is named with a C, and then Aaron named with an A, mm-hmm. but that's as close as that one gets. And then he's not scarred physically, but Kathy is, who is represent rep- representative of evil in this book. Yeah, well, and you mentioned, uh, is it is it pronounced Timsha? I, I, I think oh, it would I don't be Timshul. No, Timshul? Mm-hmm. Okay. There's no so, L. I think I think there is. Oh, I thought it was T-I-M-S-H. I read, I read it on audio, but... Oh, it, it was T... Uh, don't you know Hebrew? Book. Well, the, it's actually famously, he mis translates the or like he misrepresents what? the word what? oh interesting but that's what's that's what's interesting okay, about i did not need to know that well, that ruins it well he he is he's so he was such a careful author there's tons of speculation about why he did it and if he did it on purpose so what does the word really mean well i mean it, it really does it means the correct thing but i think uh. he, he mistransliterates it 
because it's all it's transliterated in English, and so it's that form is is mm-hmm. a little bit off. I haven't done the deep dive, but hmm. um, thou mayest. Thou mayest. Yeah. I mean, and that that is kind of one of the acceptable translations yeah. of the word. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and I feel, I think you're right, Tanya, that that is a, a central theme, but I felt like it it showed up so rarely, but so poignantly that that's what makes it that's what makes it a central theme. Mm-hmm. And so it's in some ways it'd be easy to miss because there's only like two or three scenes where that comes up. There, yeah, it's just the when it's explained. Mm-hmm. You know, when the the rabbis get together and learn Hebrew so that they can figure out what the story of Cain and Abel really is saying, and then it comes up another time, and then at the very very end. Yeah. The very, very end. I think I think we agree on what the main point is, which is a bummer because that's going to remove some of our discussion. But I think you do. You think that it's safe to say that the the point of East of Eden is to say that the miracle of humanity, that is to be a human, is to be is to be able to choose, and that the sins of our fathers are not determinative for who we are. They may affect us, they scar us, but thou mayest is kind of that's the whole point of the novel and i think it's a it's a beautiful and profound a profoundly humanistic novel I, I really like the way you encapsulated that and and i think sort of a, a a corollary that comes up from that is the character of kathy right if we're going to be allowed to choose mm-hmm. then then it is possible <laughs> to descend to such depths of evil that in some ways, I mean, in some ways, Kathy is incomprehensible because she is just so evil. She's so evil, but is is that her choice? Because he says from the very beginning that there was something missing from her. Mm-hmm. So was it her mm-hmm. choice to be evil or is there truly something missing, which you and I have talked about when, when I got to that part of it where I just thought this is just a brilliant moment. You and I haven't not talked about it. Um, where Kathy recognizes when Adam forgives her, comes and forgives her basically, and she has no clue, like, what does he want? She can't believe that somebody would actually be good. She can't conceive of that. But she recognizes in that moment that something is missing from her. And I just thought that was brilliant because up until then, she was unredemptively evil. Mm -hmm. And you know me, I need redemption somewhere in the characters. But I thought that, so that, so had she chosen evil or did it just exist within her? Like, does she represent Satan? No, I think the very fact that she re- recognizes that something's missing in her is what then gives her the choice to fix it, to, to fix it mm-hmm. or to, or to continue to live in that. Continue right? to be evil. And so I think Steinbeck is dealing with the fact that some of us grow up, from the very beginning with a more affinity towards uh, a a good life and others with a more of an affinity of a life of sin, but you are still given that choice at some point in your life. And she had a good life. She had, you know, she was doted on as an only child, but man, even as a child, she was really messed up. So, I mean, her character to me was just over the top. Like I just kept thinking, what is Steinbeck doing with this character? We should probably, I take this moment to say, like, we really haven't dug into what Kathy did, but like, this book is not for high schoolers. It is not for children. It is not for, it's not for adults who are really sensitive. It no. ha, it is very raw. Um, there are multiple scenes that take place in brothels. Um, and she is, the things that she does are just evil. Mm-hmm. And yep. so it is an adult book. Intentionally, I think. Her actions are atten- intentionally appalling in order to make you mm-hmm. confront that evil. Right. There's something about Steinpeck that is very action oriented. You know, we talk, we've talked about Wendell Berry a lot on this podcast, but with Steinbeck, you know, spoiler alerts, uh, Kathy shoots uh, Adam, you know, with a gun. Well, she kills her parents. She kills her parents. <laughs> um, there's manipulation. There's blackmail. Steinbeck is not a subtle author. No, <laughs> Things happen. no. Which is also Grapes of Wrath is That's very right. raw. Right. And I do think going back to the, I mean, I, I just think Steinbeck is brilliant. I find myself wanting to read everything that he wrote, but I, Grapes of Wrath affected me that 
like that years ago, that this was, and I still don't know that there's a better novel about poverty Mm. and our responsibility toward that. And this to me was one of the best metaphor books I've ever read that, I mean, just brilliantly done, I Mm -hmm. think. And in the, did y'all read the introduction in the beginning? Oh no, because you had different. You read it on Audible, but the introduction, I was reading it afterward. I never read them before, but afterward I was glancing through it and, and he got criticism because of the, when the book came out because of the character of Kathy, because Mm. people Mm. were like, no, that, you know, it's not, it's unrealistic. Mm. And he's and and his response was, you're wrong. Mm. (laughs) You know, there is evil. And if you haven't seen it, then you're lucky, but it is there. Can I give you guys a, uh, my theory, one of my yes. theories about the book and see, let you take it on for, you take it out for a ride and see if it, if it floats. I think that one way to see this book at, is as a reflection on brothers in the scripture. And so you have three sets of brothers that come to mind for me, Cain and Abel, of course, which is, is highlighted and prominent. Mm-hmm. And you see that um, in the story with uh, one of the sons not being favored and one of the sons being favored and the rage that causes between the two. But then there's Jacob and Esau. Mm-hmm. Yep. And in Jacob and Esau, Esau have I hated and Jacob have I loved. And that there's something good when the love of the father comes on one of, one of the sons. But then there are the prodigals, the prodigal and the elder brother in the gospels. Mm. And that the story of the gospel is that the elder brother hates his younger prodigal brother. But the reality is we're all prodigals. And that it's only love that comes down and reaches and grabs us out of these broken relationships that we're in. And you see those in each of the sets of brothers that we see in the novel. You have different aspects of these kinds of relationships between brothers and how they relate to their father. Hold on. You got Charles and Adam. Adam, right? And then you've got Aaron and Caleb. Who's the other set of brothers? Is there another just those two. Oh, those those two. Yeah. He's just saying that the that, different pieces of them yes, are with I totally agree. Yeah. And I especially at the very I mean, I think Jacob and Esau run throughout this novel, mm-hmm. but but the very end is Jacob and Esau. Mm-hmm. It's that give that blessing, give that blessing. Yes. yes. And, yeah. And well, and but I mean, Charles and Adam have that it's struggle with the inheritance that their father leaves. Yes. Right. And and you know, are they willing to accept that blessing from the father? And Aaron, Aaron is the elder brother of the God of the gospels because Aaron, you know, he's, he's pursuing good. religion. He's good. Yeah. Mm. Um, but his brother, Caleb, Kelev, the dog, that's what Caleb means in Hebrew. He, he is, you know, he's debased. He's better. And yet it's, it, that is, and I feel like that, it kind of illustrates that dynamic as well. And I thought Steinbeck did an amazing job with the, you know, we always struggle with the Cain and Abel story. Why would God have rejected Cain's offering? Why It makes no sense. It was just as good an offering as Abel's. And I thought Steinbeck did that brilliantly with the Adam's rejection of Caleb's offering because he had made money on the war. Mm-hmm. And Adam had sent all of these boys to war mm-hmm. and felt guilty about that. And so his rejection made sense that to him in his mind. And I thought, I wondered if that was something Steinbeck had always struggled with is yep. why the rejection, but he made that rejection make absolute sense. But, because, but you also felt uh, from Caleb's point, how that rejection was unjust. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a sense in which, I mean, I, I don't know enough about Steinbeck to know. I don't, he's not a Christian, right? I don't, not, somebody else said that, and I don't see how he could, I, I don't know. He's definitely writing from a Christian. Oh There's certainly uh, themes that are culturally What makes you think he wasn't a Christian? I, I just you read, know. You read no, that? I haven't, I haven't, uh, I don't know I feel, either way. But I, I wouldn't say necessarily like I would adopt Steinbeck's worldview, but I think that his reflections on the scripture are still helpful for helping me to see what's there mm-hmm. and not that he's saying everything about what's there. I thought I just thought he showed a real understanding mm-hmm. of I mean I just think how can how could you take those biblical stories put it in a whole different setting and make it work so well. Oh. But I, he did. Can I ask you all about two two characters? 
Yes. So Samuel Hamilton. Oh. Mm-hmm. Help me understand Samuel Hamilton better. Because I, I loved him as a character, but I had a hard time putting in words what his role in the story is. You know, I kind of think I know, but I'd be interested to hear what you guys think of Samuel Hamilton. I'm going to reference um, something I don't recommend anybody go watch, but in The Walking Dead, uh, there's okay. there's there's the main character, uh, Rick, who is kind of leading this group after the zombie apocalypse. Early on, he starts with a decent moral compass. And as sort of the situations drive him to be less and less uh, moral because he's just trying to survive and trying to help his group survive. They end up running into a farmer and his daughter and the farmer ends up saving Rick's son and the farmer, I can't remember his name now, uh, Herschel, old white haired farmer ends up joining the group. And it's very clear that his role is to be the moral compass. And, and I felt like Samuel fills that role for Adam when he, when he needs it. Right. So Mm -hmm. like Adam has this massive, you know, uh, traumatic event with Kathy. Right. And he's effectively in some form of a depression. Doesn't even want to name the boys for like 12 years. Was it that long? It was a long time before. Um, Maybe it wasn't 12, but it was years. Yeah, I think it was a couple of years because they were still kind of toddlerish. Before Liza sent him over to... Well, Samuel asked to go and Liza's like, don't come back unless you... Because she knows that yeah. he gets run over by by other people. And, and, you know, but then that's where he really forces Adam to kind of step up and say like, look, the, you need to be a good man, right? And that, and that partnership between Samuel and Lee... That's the other thing. Lee. I mean, uh, Samuel, Lee, are they both the moral compass? Yeah. What do you, uh, well, what do you I think, think of? I think what's interesting is because you've got Samuel, who is married to this devout Christian woman, but Samuel goes off in a barn and drinks with his buddy, like the buddies. Right. Know, like, if you're going to come over to Samuel to get him to do something, bring the alcohol, but don't bring it in the house. That's right. Um, but then you've got Lee, who's coming from. I, I'm vaguely recalling like he, he participated in some Eastern religion until he ended up converting to Christian. Am I making that up? He, at the beginning, he claims to be Presbyterian, I think to right. fit in, but he's not. But oh, he's not. Right. right. But then he ends up coming to faith. Right. So you have a man who you kind of, I think, I think Lee came to faith, right? I was going to say, where do you think Lee came to faith? In the well, conversation about well, this is where I think. I think Steinbeck is kind of advocating him just a, a very broadly humanistic kind of inclusive idea of religion where he would see this as a person connected to true faith. And I think that's where, you know, I, I don't necessarily think Lee becomes a Christian. If we want to talk about that as like a, a I don't religion. think the Christianity even comes up because yeah. we're dealing with the old Testament. Really? I mean, he's, he went to, okay. he went to Hebrew rabbis to get help. Okay. So okay. I don't know that he, I don't know that he came to faith. I don't know that I, Okay. Well, I guess that's, that's an interesting, I mean, you, you're probably right there. I mean, I didn't really think deeply about that. The, but I think the two Lee and Samuel are kind of two moral compasses coming at it mm-hmm. from two different angles. I agree with that. But I think that they're, I think in their <clears throat> act of being the moral compass, they're deepening in their own understanding. Absolutely. Right? There's definitely a journey that they mm-hmm. are both on. Oh, I, I would say, Samuel, I would say, is, you know, was, has been, had a Christian life with, I don't think Liza would have let him not. (laughs) I thought Liza was hysterical. I thought she was really some comic relief through the book. Um, Just her steadfastness and no nonsense. But there was a line when Adam went to see her after Samuel's death. There was a line where he said to her, it must be hard to rearrange your life. And I thought that was also just that one little, those few little words, mm-hmm. just that really described what it would be after the loss of a spouse. When she's mm-hmm. sitting there, she's lost her home. She's lost everything. And that's another thing that to me would be something to talk about is 
they're going away from their home. Why did it felt to me not quite right that Samuel went away from his home to die? Mm. You know, so that gets back to the short story fidelity we talked about on a podcast, right? Like letting right. Burley die on the farm. Yes. Um, but why did they I, take him away? So there's, because there's a couple of things going on there, right? Like they're afraid he's going to work himself to death, but he knows when he leaves, he's going to die. Right. Right. But he's, but he's willing to do it for his kids. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, right. I mean, that's that. But are they under the sway of this new industrial moment Mm -hmm. in America? Like, is that, is this kind of the same, exactly the same exact theme as fidelity? Probably. But, uh, but but the point I wanted to drive home is like, Samuel goes willingly, right? He mm. goes and he tells, I forget who it is, Adam, I think. Yeah. And he's like, Adam I, and Lee. I'm, you know, they're like, you're not coming back, or, you know, or like, what are you going off to? He says, I, I know they're going to send me from kid to kid, mm-hmm. you know, until I die, you know? And, and so it's a will, it's a sacrificial, it's a willing sacrificial act on his part. Um, also to, to, was it Tom, his son that is, can take over the farm? Because like no. Tom never flowers. Tom is it Tom? Isn't, I thought it's the one that, the boy that stays will. home. It's the one that stays home. Is Will's Will the, the car dealer? Okay, I think. then it's Tom. Yeah. So like Tom never never like gets out of the shadow of his, of his father. Mm-mm. And I and I kind of felt another interesting character. It was it, I I felt like it was it was Samuel's way of letting Tom also like take over the farm. Mm-hmm. One other point on Samuel is I think that he illustrates this concept that so many of the characters are determined by the things that happen to them. And that's a big Mm -hmm. aspect of the story is thou mayest versus like your father did this thing Mm -hmm. and now you're stuck. And Samuel, he lives this robust, happy, curious life, but he's always poor. Yeah. And he's like, but he's he, doing he, whatever he wants. He's kind of the contradiction. He's the free man he's living the free in man. the restraints of poverty. That's it. He's and, free. Exactly. But he doesn't look free. Right. And Adam, who has has never had to work a day in his life, who's mm-hmm. who's he's captive. He's absolutely mm-hmm. chained. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He is not free in the way that Samuel is. And what frees Samuel? What has freed him? His mind. Mm-hmm. He reads. Yeah, he his, reads. Yes. He books reads. Have There's no book off him. limits for, for Samuel. That's right. Oh, that's right. There's that moment where like he, he tells the kids, don't let your mother see that you're reading this book kind of thing right. when he's letting, letting them read. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whatever they want to read. Yeah. Um, so another question I would have for you all is um, coming back to Grapes of Wrath versus East of Eden. Which I have one? not finished Grapes of Wrath. Oh, you have? Okay. No. Where are you, where are you, are you at Grapes it? of Wrath? I, I am, but I think my... my my loan from the library expired. So now I got to wait two more weeks to pick it back up. Oh, no. um, the family's just about to head to California. Oh, okay. oh gosh. Yeah. Okay. I'm early, early on. So Tanya, I know you, we mentioned this at the beginning. Which one do you think is better? I don't know. I, I felt like they were to me, they would both be at the top of my list of American novels. Mm-hmm. Um, I would put them way above the great Gatsby. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, they're so different. They really are different, don't you think? What do you? What do you? What is your? I mean, you've read them both recently. Yeah, recently. I, I have an advantage. I think that the East of Eden is a better novel because it's doing more. There's so much more that happens. It's in like it. more complicated. It's more complicated. Mm-hmm. It's denser. It goes. It's not as clean. It, it goes in different like down different avenues. It's denser, I guess it, you could say. It maybe say. Fe- feels more like a real human feels experience. Feels very real lifelike. I would say Grapes of Wrath is very pointed. That is, it goes every, I think what's beautiful about Grapes of Wrath is it's all in service of that final scene. Everything that happens mm-hmm. takes you there. Whereas in East of Eden, you, c- I think I could just open that passage up to where Lee talks about them figuring out what temptual means. And I would just enjoy reading that passage for its own sake. Whereas in Grapes of Wrath, like if you don't have that full arc mm. to that final mm. scene, you don't get the the meat of it. Um, it. They're really hard to compare, but I think that they're different. They are so different, but both brilliant. Mm-hmm. What a talented man to be able mm. to do two great works that are very different in that way, right? Most Most authors kind of find what works for them and they kind of mm. repeatedly do that. But to have that kind of 
differing narrative arc is fascinating. Yes, I'm going to definitely read more Steinbeck, and I hate that I haven't. Yeah. Because- Tom, Tom Jay gave me a copy of The Pearl and three others, and it's sitting on my desk, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to read those. Oh, I, just, I just read The Pearl, and I, I mean, I had read it like in high school, and I just, I, it was a great, I mean, it's a, I listened to it, and it was three hours, right? It's like, it's real short. Is it a novella or a short I, story? It's a novella. Okay. It's, it's long. It's long enough to be a novella, but I just, um, I think that is also dealing with poverty and greed mm. and, um, but we again, didn't very mention pointed. though that East of Eden is somewhat by autobiographical. And when he has that scene w- that, so Steinbeck as a character is the son of Samuel's, sister right, right right and so steinbeck's life is oh, hold on woven. hold on hold on back that okay. up say that again is that right yeah steinbeck's, steinbeck's mother was samuel's sister and so samuel was steinbeck's uncle okay and then she married a steinbeck and so all throughout are references that because this novel also what he does and I don't usually like this in a novel but I found it okay because it was not long but every now and then there's a there's is a chapter that's just the narrator talking yeah but there's mm-hmm. short chapters I generally I'm like that feel I feel like that gets in the way like there's one on war mm-hmm. I don't remember the other ones there's the one about his mother that is totally unconnected the airplane chapter yes yeah and it is hysterical right. <laughs> it is so funny I mean that chapter alone would stand alone as a short story right but I do think I don't remember this yeah. airplane chapter <laughs> oh, at all. oh where is. his mother wins a trip on a plane and she thinks she's gonna die <gasps> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they have to pry her out of the plane and she goes to bed and doesn't get up for three days and it's just I just think it's just an honor to his mother. It's funny, but it's also just, you know, she says goodbye to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and they think, you know, she's just like, until I see you when we land. And she's thinking I'm going to die. And I, I mean, I do think that chapter connects to the rest of the rest of the novel. It's just not in a clear, direct way. Right. Like, it still is just about modernization in the way that that our America has changed, but that's the greatest novelists. The connections between the chapters make sense. Perfect narrative sense like his does. But then there's also this poetic element where it's like, I don't know exactly why the plane mm-hmm. fits here, but then as I come back around to him, like, yeah, actually I do. <laughs> yeah, you got to give it him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Um, yeah. And some, and you need that comic relief every now and then in a book this heavy. Yeah. I would highly recommend that anybody read it. If they're not of a too sensitive, too sure. sensitive of a nature to read Steinbeck. I feel like we could just like follow the rabbit trails of different aspects of this novel forever. But if we left anything else really significant on the table, probably I just, I want to say, I mean, you mentioned Caleb meaning the dog. I didn't realize that until I you said that. I didn't know that either. But the, and we're sorry for all the people named Caleb out there. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that I've said this somewhere, but I don't think it was on the podcast, but the conversation right before, uh, no, it's a different, it's the conversation about naming the boys mm. because he brings the Bible. Yes. That was brilliant. To, too. You know, that to me is, you know, it, it's, it's signaling that Steinbeck actually has thought about every name of the characters that he's, mm. it, that he's chosen for his characters. But it, I, I thought, I mean, just the, the thought put behind choosing a name that's that's the only place i've ever seen written uh, some sort of defense of why you would care about what you're what you would name anything right, right. whether that's children animals whatever it be and they even talked about that nobody had been named cain yeah since and but which was you know quite obvious because I wondered what they were going to do with the names of the twins mm. so it was interesting when they did and it was you know several pages of naming the twins but I agree. I think it was one of the most the brilliant of the passages. Um, what about Abra, who oh. was an ideal character, but also I thought, you know, where she she recognized that Aaron really no longer saw her for who she was, but but had idealized her 
and idealized who she was, and so he didn't really know her. Do you think that Abra and Kathy are exact opposites? I do, and like real And so each of these pairs of brothers have a female that is, one is completely devoid of love and another one completely full of love and so much Mm -hmm. love that she can't be not seen as a person. And that, but she, even despite that happening, she loves, she continues to love these brothers despite Mm -hmm. their wounds against them. And I I think there's some definite parallelism between the two. Yeah. And her, her family situation, you know, her dad going to bed because he's done something illegal in business. Yep. Yep. It was, I thought she was Kathy's parents are, are seeming moral exemplars and she has no love. And that's right. Parents are clearly, you know, one of them is a criminal and she is full of love, full of love. Do you think that's a, a statement of like, you only have so much control over how your kids are going to turn out? Oh, I don't know. Well, the whole thing is just, is destiny and fate and how right. much do our, the sins of our parents affect us? I mean, mm-hmm. it's nature over nurture. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just right at the heart of what it means to be human is to wrestle with that dynamic. <laughs> and another thing I thought was brilliant, and this is another spoiler, you know, we've talked about the, how he did the, I talked about how, how he managed the sacrifice not being accepted, but also the death of Aaron. Mm. Because you're thinking, oh, gosh, Caleb's going to kill him. But then I kept thinking all the way through, I thought, Caleb's not that bad. I couldn't figure out how this was going to happen because I just didn't see in Caleb's character that he would physically. Now, Charles, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But Caleb, I didn't feel like. I felt like he loved Aaron. And. I I just thought this is just feels like it's going to be out of character. You know, I'm worried about what Steinbeck's going to do with it because I right. thought this could ruin it. And the way he the way he managed Aaron's death, I mean, it was really a David Bathsheba Uriah mm-hmm. kind right. of thing. Right. Um, I thought was another just brilliant yeah. thing. How do you get so many brilliant things in one novel? It's a great question. Well, I think that we'd be remiss if we didn't ask any listener who's made it this far um, to tell us what we've, what we've missed, yes. what they found significant and what interpretations we left on the table. We would love to hear about them. And then maybe we could squeeze out a second. Episode. Oh yeah. That would be great. Much to Bryce's chagrin. <laughs> I would love to hear <laughs> from would, other people who have read it. Yeah. yeah it would not be hard to squeeze out another episode. I don't think <laughs> we wouldn't be squeezing. It was just, just there's no, so much we there. We did this just off the cuff. Like, <laughs> Five minutes before we decided no, to do it, none of us has the book true. with we our have notes. Very detailed uh-huh. plans. <laughs> Shane never <laughs> tells us listening. what we're doing. Never tells us what we're doing. But Thank you all okay. for listening. Uh-huh. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Classical Etc. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider liking this video. If you want to join the conversation, then you can comment below. And if you want to stay connected, please subscribe to our channel. I hope you enjoyed this show, and we'll see you next time.